Presonus just released Studio One 6, and in this video, we're gonna be covering some of its newest features. Okay, so there are actually 10 key new features in this new version, and of course, we'll cover those first, but Studio One 6 actually comes with a lot more, so I'll make sure to mention some of my favorite smaller additions towards the end. Huge thank you to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video. I'll make sure to link Studio One 6 and the official release notes down below, but with that being said, let's dive in. Okay, so let's start off with some aesthetics. Studio One 6 arrives with a new look, and from what I can tell here, it looks like these grays have been shifted, so if you go back to version five, up top here near the toolbar, we had a light gray, and then a dark gray in the inspector. If you go back to six, those two have been flipped. Personas also claims that they have increased the font size and text spacing slightly, which should result in better readability. But honestly, the biggest change to me is that they've rounded off the corners off of some of these buttons, if you take a look here, which to me just looks a lot better. Lastly, of course, we also get a brand new Studio One icon, which takes those blacks, grays, and blues and makes them a little lighter. Now, the facelift doesn't stop there because for the first time ever, we now actually get the ability to customize how we want our personal personal copy of Studio One to look like. One of the things that I've always loved about Studio One is how intuitive it is. Nonetheless, for others, and especially if you're brand new to DAWs and audio in general, things can still look a little daunting and nothing stops you dead on your tracks more than feeling overwhelmed. Not only that, but as powerful as Studio One is, maybe you just don't need to see all the options because they don't apply to you. Well, in Studio One 6, you now have the option to customize your interface by only showing the functions that you actually use. Now, the easiest way that I found to get started with this is to go to the top section here where you see the toolbar, right click and select customize. Now, once you do that, you're gonna get this pop-up menu here where you can select or unselect options to hide or unhide based on your preferences. The best part is that you get this capability for not only the toolbar here on the timeline, but also the inspector on the left, the transport bar here at the bottom, and even the browser on the right. The icing on the cake here is that you can actually save multiple preset configurations for different tasks. So maybe you have one for mixing, one for beat making, and so on. Personas has also even given you a few preset options here to get you started, depending on how much you choose to see. Now, if we head over to the start page here, you can see that this also looks a little different. And the first thing that I wanna point out is how we now have the ability to create different artist profiles for the different clients that we work with. Now to do so, all you have to do is go down to the bottom here of the artist profile section and then click on this little paper icon. From here, you can add or remove new artists and also flip between them depending on who you are working with at the moment. Now, once you're on a profile, of course, you can come down here at the bottom and add their information. And this is really useful because this information information is actually embedded automatically as ID3 tags when exporting a mix down, so that's really handy. While we are here, let's also talk about the new smart templates. So we've always had plenty of default templates that Persona's provided, but to me, the presentation always felt a little bit more overwhelming than anything. If you take a look at version five here, this is what the new song panel looked like. Plenty of options, but just way too much going on. If we shift back to version six, you can see that this view has now changed. And instead of throwing everything at you, it looks like Personas has chosen to take a simpler approach by asking you, what do you want to do today? Maybe you want to rehearse and perform, or maybe you want to produce beats or even create content. More on that later. Each of these smart templates come pre-configured with tracks and channels. And in some cases, depending on the template, they even come with an integrated drop zone here so that you can easily import your files and begin working. This is another subtle shift, but catering to workflows as opposed to just listing styles or functionality is going to make a world of a difference. And especially to people who are just getting started with Studio One. Okay, moving back inside the program, we now have some new improvements to the browser and how instrument and plugin presets are stored. First, we now have the ability to create custom preset folders for plugins and instruments. This is a nice addition because if you have a plugin or VST with a large number of presets, this would allow you to categorize them based off your own categories and needs. To get started, open up the browser and either click on the instrument or the effects tab, and then look for a plugin or VST. From there, select the preset folder, right click, and then select new folder. You can name this whatever you want, and once this is created, you can then start to drag presets over to that folder 
to store them. If I were to open this exact VST, which in my case was Serum, and then I drop down this little preset window here, I should be able to find the folder that I created. So there it is and the preset that I stored within it. Now, an important thing to note here is that from what I've been able to tell, this is not actually moving the actual preset file from where it is to the new folder. It is just creating a copy because if we take a look here, it is still in the same location where it was, but also in the folder that I created. Now, aside from creating custom folders, the other thing we can do now is favorite presets for faster access. So using Serum again here as an example, we can now select any preset from this drop-down menu, right click, and then hit favorite. Once you do that, the preset will be listed under a newly created favorites folder near the top here for easy access. Now, both of these are great, but there is one big caveat to this that we need to talk about. In order for this to work, the VST or effect in question has to have their presets listed in Studio One. I'm not quite sure how this works from a developer standpoint, but having these presets listed inside of Studio One is not something that all VSTs and plugins do. From what I've been able to find, most Studio One native plugins, of course, have this functionality, but when it comes to third-party VSTs, this is not always the case. Serum, for example, here does this automatically, but if I head over to Xband 2, which is another popular VST, you can see that this is not the case, so I would not be able to use these two new features. Again, I don't know what it would take to make this happen for third-party plugins, but we won't be able to use these two features to their fullest potential until more VSTs get this functionality as well. Now, if your VST does not support preset listing, then what I would recommend you do is that once you find a preset that you like, go to the top left here and hit this paper icon and then hit store preset. This is another way to store favorite presets that we've had for a while that still works quite well. So if I were to show you this now, I'm gonna just make test, hit okay and it shows up right there. Last but not least, the browser now also gets several search improvements to allow for proper handling of special characters and the inclusion of folder names in your searches. Moving on, the next big feature in Studio One 6 is track presets. So it's nice if you get the favorite presets and VSTs and effects for faster access, but what happens when you come across a sound, a patch, that you really like and you start to add effects to make it your own? What if you really like that sound and you wanna save that for later use in future projects? Well, all of this is now possible with the new track preset feature. With this new feature, we are now able to store both track and channel parameters to effectively create a snapshot for any VST or audio recording, which will include any track delay, time stretching, chord follows, the VST and the preset, of course, if one was used, volume, panning, inserts, internal routing, send assignments, and even name and color. This really is a game-changing feature, for me at least, because it will allow me to instantly recall any sound that I created in previous projects with all of its parameters in place. To store a track preset, all you basically have to do is right-click on any track and then head down to the bottom to the store track preset option. Once you do this, you'll get a pop-up window and here you can name the preset give it a description, and then even assign it to a subfolder within the track presets folder. What I would recommend you do is that you create your own folder. So here, as you can see, I created one called Favored Patches. So once I save that, it should go directly in there. Now, once you're ready to recall, all you have to do is again on this little track area, right click, but this time go down to select where it says Load Track Preset. Find your folder for easy access. So again, Favored Patches, I had the Plux and go ahead and hit okay. Now the original track here had the volume set to negative 28.5 and then also had an Echo Boy 2 and a Murder Melodies. And as we can see, that second plugin is exactly identical. Of course, in proper Studio One fashion, you can also just open up your browser and then drag over the tracks to your timeline or to that folder to either save or recall. Next up, we have the new mixer channel overview. So this is a simple addition, but really useful if you're someone like me who mostly stays in the timeline view when producing. Because I only use one screen for production and I hate going back and forth between the timeline view and the mixer, I oftentimes just open up the inspector panel here on the left and then work from there to make any adjustments to my production. Well, we now have a new way to use this workflow and that involves you clicking this little button here near the bottom of the volume fader for any track. As soon as you do this, you get a new pop-up window with a much more consolidated view of all the channel parameters, including its inserts, sends, Q mixes, volume fader, of course, the record enable, the monitor enable, mute, send, notes, panning, everything. I probably won't use this feature all the time, but I do see it being useful in scenarios where I'm spending a lot of time tweaking a sound. Instead of trying to work from a smaller inspector window here on the left, or by going back and forth between the mixer, I can simply open this up while tweaking a sound, while also having the timeline events in the background, should I need to make changes there. 
Okay, while we're on the topic of mixing, let's also talk about the new Fader Flip feature. So in a nutshell, this feature allows you to link and control the level for an effects or cue send directly from the channel's main volume fader. To do this, right click on any effects bus and then select the Flip Faders 2 option. Alternatively, you could also just click the Sends drop down menu and then select the Flip Faders 2 option from here. As you can see, the moment that I do this, all the faders turn green and go all the way down to negative infinity, except for the ones that have send routing back over to this effect. So as you can see one here and one over here. If you move these faders, you will now be controlling the send level that is linked to that specific channel. So I think this is an interesting addition, but I'm not quite sure when I would use this because of how much more effort it takes for me to activate the fader flip as opposed to just doing it the old fashioned way. This is even more true now that sends and pans get a brand new pop up window here, making it really easy to make adjustments to these parameters. So to give you an example, if I wanted to adjust the send level for this room reverb on this guitar using the fader flip, I would have to first use one of the two options mentioned. So let me go ahead and do that now. Then once I do that, go down here to the bottom and adjust that parameter. This in contrast is just simply double clicking on that send level from the guitar and then making my adjustment right away. The one way that I can see Persona's building on this to make it really useful, at least for me, is to allow the fader link to automatically shift to whatever track you have selected because it doesn't do that at the moment. You have to manually change it yourself. And then that way you can bind the fader flip feature to a keyboard shortcut and ultimately reduce travel time. At the moment, of course, we have the option to set that fader flip to a keyboard shortcut, but it does stay stuck on whatever you set to it last. So if you want to update it, you have to go through the steps mentioned before, or if you already did it, go to the top left here and select that new send from the fader flip drop down menu. This feature has a lot of potential, so I really hope that Presonus builds on this soon. Next up, I'm happy to announce that we have some new plugins. So the first one is long overdue, and that is a de -esser. I'm not quite sure why we didn't have one already, but we do now. Another brand new plugin here is the vocoder, which can be used to create the famous talking instrument effect. And last but not least, we have a new version of the native Studio One EQ, which comes with two new powerful additions. The first is that every band here can now be soloed, and this is ultimately great because it means that you don't have to lose your hearing by boosting and sweeping to find that annoying frequency like we're all used to. The second upgrade is that the EQ now gains a dynamic mode, which essentially now turns it also into a dynamic EQ. So these two features are two among the list of many why people like myself use third-party EQs like the one from Fat Filter. And there's still quite a few things that those do that this doesn't, but man, is this great news for people who just want to stay native and still get their work done. Okay, moving back up to the timeline, we have two new track lanes, and the first is a brand new video track. So up until now, Studio One has had the ability to host a video file, and this is important for composers who need to create music to a visual, but with this latest feature, we basically now get a video editor inside of Studio One. To open up the video track, head to the top left, click this little icon here, drop this menu down and select the video option. Now, once you do that, you'll get immediately presented with this new lane. And once this is open, you can go ahead and start to drag your own video clips and even do some basic video editing. Now, once this clip is in here, like I said, you can press the command on a Mac or the PC equivalent to bring up this little slicer tool and you can rearrange things to do whatever you need to do. So this, without a doubt, was built with content creators in mind. The traditional video player won't be going anywhere, but this new feature I think is great. If you're a content creator and you need to create music or maybe just narrate around content and even do some basic editing all in one place. So that was the video track, but now let's talk about the new lyric track. To access the lyric track, go ahead and open it up in the same way that we did the video track by clicking on this little icon here and then hitting the lyric option. From here, you can double click anywhere on this lyric track to start adding lyrics to that section of the song and even move them around. If this track is a little too restricting for you, you can press this little L symbol here to open up a notepad that gives you a better view of your lyrics. Now from here, of course, you can press this little pen button to start to edit things and even adjust the grid value and show the ruler. Now I am predominantly making beats whenever I am in the studio, so I don't write a lot of lyrics and therefore 
I don't have a lot of suggestions here, but as I continue to work with artists, I will definitely bring this up to see how useful it becomes. All right, so the very last new key feature here is the advanced collaboration with Sphere. Sphere was introduced a while back as Personas' subscription product that gives you access to not only Studio One, but many other features, and a big part of this has always been the community and collaboration. The collaboration part has gotten an upgrade with this version because before, if you wanted to work with someone else and send them your files via Sphere, you had to manually archive and upload those zip files. Well, in this new version, there is a new collaboration feature built right into Studio One that allows you to save and upload your project files into a workspace in Sphere. To access this, all you have to do is head over to the top menu and under file, you should find that collaboration drop down menu. Here you get a bunch of options to send and receive project files, but to get started, all you have to do is hit that share button. From there, Studio One will save your project and then you'll get a pop-up window where you can select to what workspace you wanna upload this to and to what collaborators you wanna send this to. If you don't have collaborators already set up, then you can send people email invites here all from the same page. And the best part is that the collaborators don't even have to have a Sphere membership. Now, once you do this, those members, those collaborators will receive an email with instructions on how to join your project. Now, the way this works is that as a collaborator, once you're done, you would go back up to this menu hit send, that would create a new updated version, upload that, and then the other person would hit receive to download those new files, and you would keep that going until you guys are done, at which point you would hit the unlink button. This is a fantastic feature and it all sounds great in theory, so I will definitely be diving in more to test it and see how it works to collab with other producers, maybe even some of you guys. Okay, so those were the top 10 new features, but now let's quickly go over some of the additional quality of life improvements that I really enjoyed. So as mentioned before, we now get these little pop-up windows for sends, pans, and I believe also Q sends, which make it a lot easier to control these parameters. Speaking of panning, we now get two new panning modes, which include dual and binaural, which eliminates the need for any external plugins. We finally get the ability to send from an effects channel. I've been waiting for this one way too long. Native plugins have always had the ability to have micro controls that can be accessed by dropping down this little menu in the mixer. These are handy for quick adjustments and in version six, we now get the ability to do this with third party plugins. But the best part is that we actually get to set up what micro parameters we want to see on a plugin per plugin basis. So until now, if you wanted to copy inserts from one channel to the other, you could do it, but only to one other channel at a time. Well, in Studio One Six, we now can do this to multiple channels. Let me show you this real quick. I'm gonna go ahead and take all these sends from this effect bus. So Command C, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all these, Command V, and there it is. Channels in the mixer now have the ability to have channel icons here, as you can see at the bottom, which will make it easier to determine what channel it is. To turn these on, all you have to do is go to the top left here to this wrench, and then go down to the bottom to where you see channel icons. From here, you can head down to any channel, and then near the bottom, you can bring up this little icon panel and select the one you want. Much like with the tracks on the timeline, we now get visibility filters for channels in the console to hide or unhide specific channels based on certain criteria. To access this, first go down to the hamburger icon, which you can find on the bottom left of the console here, and then hit these three little dots. Last but certainly not least, we also now get a target loudness option on the export pop-up. Here, you can adjust the target loudness to match certain platforms. So as you can see, we have Spotify, Netflix, and many, many more. And then we also get the ability to adjust the max loudness and max true peak parameters. This feature was available in the mastering project page, but now in version six, we also get it here in the song page as well. But there you have it. These are the main 10 new key features, along with some of my favorite smaller quality of life improvements that are now available for us to use in Studio One 6. Overall, I think all these features are definitely welcome, and it is no doubt that Studio One is becoming more and more powerful with each iteration, but 
As a beat maker and producer, I do wish we could see more specific production features. As great as it is and as much as I love it, I still think Studio One has a ton of room for improvement when it comes to sampling features and just MIDI in general. Let me know your thoughts on Studio One 6 and what you think Persona should include in future versions. Thank you once again to Studio Water for sponsoring this video. I'll make sure to leave the link to Studio One 6 down below. Thank you for your time and I'll see you on the next one.